Hello, everyone. Uh, welcome to Multimodality Imaging Conference. My name is Man Malafshi. We had a last-minute change in the schedule, so I'll be presenting on stress CMR today, and Dr. Chang uh, will present on CT next week. So if you came expecting CT, you know, you get to hear about the better test, which is CMR. Uh, please uh, join on pollev.com and enter Debakey if you want to ask questions or interact with us. We have a, a good number of cases to talk through. You can also text Debakey to 37607 and text in your question, and we'll go through these. Um, the local crew, I hope you guys are ready to go through some cases, and uh, let's see if we can interpret all of these perfectly, as we always do. Um, so a bit of outline of what we're going to talk about. We're going to talk a little bit about the methodology of stress MRI, uh, some of the evidence that really grew exponentially within the past um, 20 years or so. Uh, we'll talk about the chest pain guidelines, and I gotta, I'm kind of lucky to be able to uh, talk through this now because they really just came out a few weeks ago, and we'll go through cases. Uh, I'll start with the guidelines, though, because this is a, a recent change, and um, this is a new and very important document that really highlights uh, very important and recent changes in the way we evaluate chest pain patients and um, how we can um, choose the best test for the, uh, for the right patient. So uh, in terms of considerations, there is a bit of focus on um, which modality fits best in terms of what you're trying to look for. And some of the suggestions that the guidelines make are uh, trying to target uh, testing towards specific or um, a, a certain patient group. So for example, younger patients with, with, an un, with a lower likelihood or a slightly lower likelihood of having uh, coronary disease or those who you're interested in trying to determine if there is atherosclerotic disease uh, may be better off being served with coronary CT. Uh, whereas intermediate to high risk patients, older patients, or those with known obstructive disease um, may be better off being uh, served with stress testing or functional testing. Uh, an important aspect when it comes to MRI is that it, hit really, it really hits a lot of uh, salient and important points uh, in terms of uh, those who need quantitative flow assessment, uh, in terms of who, those who have LV dysfunction, or if you're interested in looking at the presence or absence of SCAR. Uh, I would really give stress MRI multiple check marks here, particularly with SCAR. And I hope I can show you that in terms of identification of myocardial infarction or non-ischemic injuries, yeah. uh, stress MRI and MRI in general has an advantage over the other tests. Um, we'll also talk about potential exercise capacity and um, how exercise MRI could be done. Um, the other very important change, particularly when it comes to MRI, is those who present with acute chest pain now have a class of recommendation um, of one uh, for MRI, whether they don't have any known coronary disease, whether they have known coronary disease and a prior bypass, particularly also those with an MI and no obstructive coronary uh, disease on the uh, angiogram, uh, and those with potential myocarditis, all of these now um, are served with a class one recommendation for MRI. Um, as well as those with uh, known CAD. Uh, the strength of recommendation is generally the same for stress MRI as it is for the other strategies, and we'll go through uh, some of this in a little bit more detail. So here's an example. Uh, someone with an acute chest pain episode, uh, no known coronary disease, intermediate risk, um, you can go with either an anatomic strategy or a functional strategy, but notice all of the functional testing uh, strategies receive the same recommendation. Someone with acute chest pain and known coronary disease, you can also see that essentially stress MRI receives the same level of recommendation as other functional testing modalities. And uh, if you look at those who have acute chest pain, a troponin uh, abnormality, but no obstructive disease on coronary angiography or CT angiography, uh, CMR is uh, highly recommended and is trying to establish an alternative diagnosis or uh, establishing where the infarct uh, happened. 
Um, in those who have suspected myocarditis, CMR is also highly recommended uh, to determine the presence and extent of inflammation. You can also assess the pericardial inflammation. This is highly beneficial in following patients on therapy as well. And uh, all of these really are uh, classes of recommendation one for MRI. Uh, what about patients with stable chest pain? Uh, same thing, those with stable coronary disease or stable uh, chest pain suggestive of ischemic heart disease, class one recommendation for MRI, whether they have no obstructive, no coronary disease, no known coronary disease, whether they have established obstructive disease, uh, prior bypass, and whether they have a prior evaluation that showed uh, atherosclerotic disease without obstruction. And uh, patients with Ischemic disease, but no uh, observed epicardial disease, also have a, um, a class 2A recommendation for MRI to uh, try to determine coronary microvascular disease, and we'll get into that in a little bit more detail further on. Um, this is another summary, and essentially says the same thing. You can choose whichever test your institution and your expertise is more, um, you know, is more beneficial. Um, and then you could also consider um, what other questions you're trying to answer with the test. Uh, for example, does a patient have concomitant valvular disease where you want to be able to evaluate that further? Does a patient have any concomitant aortic disease where you get multiple you know, questions answered within the same test? Uh, then you can consider MRI for these kind of cases. Um, this essentially goes through the same thing, and particularly for those uh, with um, established disease where you want to quantify uh, myocardial blood flow, uh, both uh, PET and CMR uh, are recommended. And I'll skip over this, and this I already discussed. And uh, there is still a recommendation for stress echocardiography uh, for those with uh, suspected microvascular disease, but notice the strength of the recommendation for PET or MRI is stronger, and um, you can really uh, both risk stratify these patients with MRI uh, based on recent data that we'll go through, and you can also try to um, establish potential uh, implications for research when it comes to people with pre-existing cardiomyopathies and myocardial blood flow, and we'll discuss that in a little bit more detail. So how is MRI done, um, and why is it done? Uh, some of the advantages are a higher spatial resolution, a higher temporal resolution. If you look at traditional SPECT cameras, the resolution that you get is closer to about 10 millimeters, whereas with MRI you get a 1.5 millimeter resolution uh, in terms of uh, ischemic testing and SCAR testing. So there is a significant advantage uh, to MRI in this regard. Um, BMI is usually not a limitation, and uh, very high quality imaging can be done in patients uh, who are obese or morbidly obese. There's no ionizing radiation. You can assess coronary anomalies as well, particularly in younger patients. Uh, and then, like I said, you know, a very important uh, aspect to MRI is the ability to look at scarring, uh, viability, all in one test. Um, in terms of quantitative blood flow, an important aspect is there's a linear relationship between the image intensity and the contrast agent concentration. So uh, this is also highly beneficial for quantitative uh, blood flow assessment. And this contrasts to uh, SPECT uh, agents, for example, where there's this uh, roll-off phenomenon that um, we explained or went through the previous talks. Um, another important parameter is time. Uh, you know, MRI is generally perceived to be an expensive and very lengthy test. That is not the case anymore. Um, we'll talk a little bit about cost effectiveness further uh, into the talk, but in terms of time, uh, really you can do a focused uh, stress MRI test within 20 to 30 minutes, um, excluding the preparation time, which the more efficient your institution and your lab becomes at, uh, becomes at doing this, uh, really you can uh, do a very strong number of cases within a day uh, compared to nuclear imaging techniques. Uh, there's no preparation needed in terms of viability assessment uh, in contrast to PET imaging where uh, there's a dietary preparation needed.
Um, in terms of how the imaging is generally acquired, I don't really want to get into the details of ischemic testing because we've covered that in the previous talks and the general um, principles apply. Um, what we do with stress MRI is that the contrast is injected into the peripheral vein, uh, both at stress as well as rest uh, cases, and then high resolution, very rapid acquisitions are obtained uh, to show the contrast bolus going through the right ventricle uh, onto the left ventricle blood pool and then enhancing the myocardium. And in terms of visual assessment, what we're trying to look at is um, if there is a delay in the arrival of the contrast bolus into a certain coronary territory at stress and how that looks uh, compared to rest and then also how that looks compared to the scar imaging. Uh, so uh, one thing here is that all of these data has to be acquired essentially within those heartbeats. Each of the images that you're seeing uh, in this cine, for example, um, are acquired within... Uh, the following 50 to 60 beats that follow the contrast injection. So uh, as compared to the Cine MRIs that we discussed a few talks ago, uh, where we traditionally acquired the imaging over multiple heartbeats, here the acquisition has to be rapid enough that you acquire essentially the, the entire image uh, within two or 300 milliseconds. And the way you do this is by acquiring uh, three slices that cover the short axis uh, of the heart uh, within each heartbeat. And there's multiple ways to um, s technically to, uh, to create these sequences or to apply these sequences with multiple readout pulses that uh, I don't really want to get into much into the detail of, but uh, to give you uh, a bit of a um, an overview of how it's done, there's multiple uh, sequences. One is the balance SFP, uh, which is the same uh, sequence we use for cine imaging. Uh, you can also use a, an accelerated uh, gradient echo, and as well as the echo planar imaging. And each of these has their strengths and their weaknesses. Uh, there's been a suggestion that these SSFP sequences, due to having a very good um, signal-to-noise ratio and a contrast-to-noise ratio, may be better than the traditional um, grading echo sequences in detecting perfusion defects. However, there is also a trade-off, uh, as it is with most uh, MRI uh, sequences, where you're more likely to have artifacts. So each uh, institution and um, for the particular type of scanner, whether it's 1.5 or 3 Tesla, will generally choose a, a variation of each of these sequences. Uh, the, you know, the major point of this is that uh, do what your, you know, your scanner allows you to do to, the, to achieve the best imaging quality and a lot of adjustments and uh, modifications need to happen, especially early on as you start doing these scans. Uh, what about dobutamine and exercise MRI? Uh, in terms of dobutamine, uh, it was traditionally done uh, within the past, you know, in the early 2000s or late 90s. It essentially utilized the same uh, principles as dobutamine stress echo. Uh, there is supportive data. Uh, there are some challenges. As the heart rate uh, increases, it becomes a little bit challenging to interpret wall motion abnormalities, particularly because of the temporal resolution of MRI is still not going to be as good as echo. And it really has really kind of fallen out of favor within the past 10 years in favor of um, adenosine or regadenosine perfusion MRI. Um, in terms of stress MRI with exercise, it is doable. Uh, it's not really widely utilized. A uh, few uh, select centers uh, have have very good experience with it. Um, I think it has very uh, useful and important implications beyond just traditional ischemic testing, uh, such as pulmonary hypertension and RV reserve, trying to differentiate patients with Astley's heart versus a subclinical cardiomyopathy, uh, patients with valvular heart disease. And it is doable. Um, you can have a magnet safe treadmill that sits right next to the uh, magnet and the patient exercises and then uh, goes onto the scanner.
um, this is how these compare in terms of timing. So if you do a do if you do a dobutamine uh, MRI, you start with survey imaging and then the rest cine imaging for function at baseline for all of these tests. Uh, in terms of dobutamine, you do it essentially the same way we do um, stress echo with dobutamine. Um, in terms of perfusion. Uh, you start with the adenosine or regadenosine in uh, other cases, uh, scenarios, and you, you perform your stress perfusion uh, with contrast, and then you give another bolus of contrast to get your rest perfusion, and then about 20 minutes later, uh, you will be able to do your LGE imaging. Uh, in terms of uh, traditional exercise imaging uh, or exercise testing, uh, the patient would start off by going on the treadmill, then they would hop on the table, uh, you get stress cines, and then you get, you get the same um, perfusion imaging as you do here, uh, obviously at the penalty of time. So uh, this is a video that shows how it's done, and you can see um, there's actually been multiple research studies that show the timing difference between the patient finishing the treadmill and how quickly the cine can be uh, started on the MRI. Um, as you know from stress echo data, it is critical to essentially achieve your, the entirety of your testing within the next minute to, uh, to two or at, at least a minute after uh, the patient stops exercising. So with, uh, you know, the more experienced the, the, the lab gets into, uh, gets at doing this, the quicker you can do it. Uh, you can also do a treadmill, uh, stress MRI, and let's go through a case before it gets too uh, overbearing. So this is an 86-year-old man with heart failure. Uh, there was a question of uh, low flow, low gradient AS, uh, but the patient has known coronary disease, and uh, the question is, is ischemia responsible for the patient's symptoms, or is it the aortic stenosis? So we have stress on top, and then we have rest on the bottom. And generally, we acquire three slices that cover the short axis of the heart and the base to mid to apex. For particularly uh, larger hearts or if the patient is able to um, hold their breath, um, sorry, if, if the patient's heart rate allows, you can also do four uh, slices. Um, and here, we're seeing the contrast bolus uh, go through the RV into the LV. And if you zoom on this or focus on this area here, uh, you notice that there is a perfusion defect in the inferolateral wall, uh, which you don't see at rest. And if we go through the LGE imaging, uh, you see that there is a small infarct here in this inferolateral wall um, segment. So uh, we'll get in a little bit more into the exact method of interpretation, but here we have essentially the impression of a subendocardial infarct in the inferolateral wall, uh, probably corresponding to the OM territory, associated with a perfusion defect on stress that uh, extends beyond the area of the infarct. So there is scar with perinfarct ischemia. Um, and then the patient had a cath, and as you can see, they have a total slash subtotal sequential uh, stenosis in the OM. Uh, they have an RCA lesion here, which you could argue we couldn't really see, although it certainly looks significant. And we'll get a little bit more into this further on. You could potentially try to identify cases like this with two-vessel disease or three-vessel disease, where quantitative perfusion can potentially identify these beyond uh, with a higher sensitivity compared to uh, visual uh, assessment of perfusion defect. Now, in terms of how we interpret these, uh, this is a paper from 2006 from the Duke group, which um, um, wasn't a huge uh, pa uh, patient cohort. It was about 100 patients, but it was very thorough and very methodical. And the algorithm that they came up with is to actually start with the delayed enhancement uh, MRI to identify the presence of SCAR. Because if the patient has, an evidence, has any evidence of MI, you've already established that they have coronary disease. And once you establish the presence or absence of an infarct on the delayed enhancement, then you go to your stress perfusion images. If there is no defect on stress, uh, 
uh, you can determine, and there is no scarring, you can determine that this patient doesn't have any coronary disease. If there is a defect on stress, you compare that against rest perfusion. If you see a defect on both stress and rest, that suggests a potential um, artifact uh, because with stress MRI and rest perfusion, since it's done right after the stress, you shouldn't really see any defect there because the contrast got, uh, got into that area already. Uh, whereas if you see a reversible defect uh, where a stress perfusion defect is there but not on rest, uh, this suggests coronary disease. And they found that the, this algorithm can increase the yield uh, for diagnosing uh, CAD and ischemia beyond just looking at the perfusion MRI. Um, this is another strength that I think highlights the advantages of MRI versus traditional SPECT imaging. Uh, same group, a uh, paper from 2003, and essentially uh, shows that there is an improved sensitivity for detecting infarcts, particularly, well, specifically subendocardial infarcts by MRI uh, over SPECT imaging, and this was validated also with an animal model where the sensitivity for uh, SPECT to detecting these small subendocardial infarcts uh, was very low compared to MRI. So this really, uh, in a way, sort of favors or uh, emphasizes this algorithm because once you use the delayed enhancement, it has such high sensitivity and specificity that it really improves the yield of testing. Um, now let's go through some papers that uh, came out within the past 20 years and were really um, very critical to the development of stress MRI. Um, I'm not. I'm going to miss some of them, but this is the CE Mark study, and this essentially established the diagnostic accuracy for stress MRI against uh, coronary angiography, and also compared the MRI against SPECT. Uh, it included patients with angina and uh, at least one uh, cardiovascular risk factors, and they were scheduled for essentially all three tests. The sensitivity of MRI was pretty high. Specificity was very good. Um, both of these, uh, both the sensitivity and the negative predictive value uh, were better for MRI, whereas the positive predictive value and specificity were not different. Now, the critical uh, finding, in my opinion, also from this study is um, whether it's all patients uh, using um, the 50% cutoff for left main and 70 for uh, other epicardial disease, or whether it's two or three vessel disease, which where we know uh, nuclear imaging techniques with SPECT can, can sometimes suffer, uh, the sensitivity of MRI was higher. Uh, the CE Mark study followed, and this essentially had a a, um, a, um, a design where patients with suspected ischemic heart disease were randomized to either CMR guided care versus perfusion guided care versus uh, the NICE guidelines uh, directed care, and the authors looked at the rates of unnecessary invasive angiography, and uh, MRI was essentially non-inferior or equivalent to uh, perfusion imaging in trying to reduce the rates of unnecessary cath. And um, in terms of the events, uh, there was no difference between the, the two groups. Um, we always look at the ischemic thresholds with nuclear testing, and we all know the ischemia trial results. And um, in terms of MRI, uh, there was a single study that looked at uh, not just the presence of ischemia, but also the burden uh, defined as number of ischemic segments uh, on a 16-segment model. Um, and they looked at a primary outcome of uh, death MI and revascularization. And they found that a threshold of 1.5 ischemic segments was a predictor of the uh, primary and secondary um, event. Uh, but um, there are other papers that showed a slightly contradictive, uh, contradictory finding, findings. Uh, so we'll uh, get into that a little bit. Uh, in this paper, they uh, saw that the model, including ischemic burden, SCAR, and LVEF, was uh, superior to looking at SCAR and LVEF uh, uh, in of itself without looking at ischemia. Um, in terms of prognostication, uh, I'm going to just try to highlight a couple important papers just for the sake of time. Uh, this is a paper that looked at 9,100 patients with 1,500 events, and these were mortalities. This is one of the few papers that utilize the SEMR registry and essentially um, showed that the presence of ischemia is 
uh, predictive of, pro uh, of uh, hard outcomes, whether the patient has coronary disease, no coronary disease, normal LVEF, n abnormal LVEF, um, and essentially the findings were consistent across all subgroups. Um, the SPINS trial, um, which we participated with along with the, with the previous study, uh, looked at uh, stress MRIs from 13 centers and uh, included patients with at least a follow-up of four years uh, with the primary outcome of uh, CV death or non-fatal MI. Uh, this study looked at 2,300 patients and followed for a median of 5.4 uh, years. And as with other uh, um, studies, and from what we intuitively know, uh, the presence of ischemia plus scar uh, was associated with the highest hazard for events compared to uh, presence of scar without ischemia or uh, lack thereof of uh, either scar or ischemia. Um, in terms of uh, other findings from this from the SPINS trial, um, the primary outcome um, was uh, had a graded response in terms of uh, lack of ischemia or scar versus presence of ischemia scar, and this persisted throughout the follow-up duration for the uh, for the study. Uh, another important uh, finding from the SPINS trial is that patients with negative stress MRI, no ischemia, no scarring, had very uh, low average uh, costs on downstream ischemic testing uh, compared to uh, stress nuclear highlight here in yellow, whereas the stress CMR in black you can barely see uh, in terms of annual costs for future testing. Um, X-ray angiography obviously associated with high costs, and CT, uh, I would argue, probably has a little bit of a higher cost if you include the downstream uh, increased um, uh, rate of cath following CT. Um, not only this, but the rate of revascularization was also persistently um, um, associated across the years of follow-up, and um, the the extent of ischemia wasn't really associated um, with the rates of revascularization as compared to the previous study that um, uh, we looked at. And, you know, this could potentially argue that, you know, it makes you wonder whether patients with one segment of ischemia may have been false positive scans. Obviously not all of them, but some of them may be. Um, in terms of... Um, uh, one important finding from the SPINS trial, though, uh, when the core lab assessed about 10% of, uh, of the studies included within the trial, uh, there was only a modest concordance rate between um, um, the core lab and the individual site's uh, interpretation of the MRIs. So there's still work to be done in this aspect, and um, we'll see if, uh, if future developments, particularly with quantitative perfusion and more automated acquisition of these and interpretation, uh, could potentially help. Uh, an important sub-study of the SPINS trial looked at um, healthcare costs and looked at um, quality-adjusted life years, uh, comparing stress MRI against CT, against an a strategy of immediate uh, coronary angiography or no imaging uh, for patients with chest pain. And it utilized findings from the SPINS trial as well as historical findings from previous studies that looked at um, uh, other testing modalities. And what they found was that um, the, the, the strategy of stress MRI was actually the most optimal in terms of uh, minimizing costs uh, while achieving uh, quality-adjusted life years, uh, where obviously, as you expect, uh, immediate coronary angiography was not cost-effective. And then SPECT and uh, coronary CT also resulted in higher costs while achieving lower uh, quality-adjusted life years compared to MRI. Um, and this, I believe, I covered already. Uh, a no-imaging strategy, uh, as you expect, uh, was associated with lower costs uh, and then a lowest rate of diagnosis of obstructive disease, but also uh, was associated with a lower life expectancy and a lower uh, quality-adjusted life years. So uh, in this paper, the conclusion uh, is that MRI could potentially be um, uh, a test to uh, achieve better outcomes while uh, minimizing uh, additive costs. Uh, these are the conclusions from the SPIN trial, the SPIN trial overall.
um, it comp the, the, the MRI strategy was optimal for patients with an intermediate disease prevalence uh, with a lower likelihood that the patient will have a false negative results which would lead to a return for further testing or angiography within the year. Uh, whereas a high prevalence of disease or a high risk patient uh, would favor immediate coronary angiography. Um, a high likelihood of return after a false negative uh, favors no imaging. If you uh, think the patient is low risk and um, their chest pain symptoms are um, not convincing, um, then you could consider uh, coronary calcium testing as the chest pain guidelines say, but um, there should be really a push for uh, no imaging uh, or no further testing in patients that are low risk with non-convincing chest pain symptoms. Um, so this will address one of the questions that we got, which uh, says, how is stress EMR similar to invasive FFR? So this is one of the latest uh, trials that came in the FFR and CMR world, and this is the MR-informed trial. Uh, the hypothesis is that guiding initial management uh, with stable angina, uh, immediate to high-risk coronary disease, uh, by MRI uh, is not inferior to invasive uh, angiography and FFR. Um, so this is testing a strategy, not the accuracy of stress MRI versus FFR in of itself, uh, but you could argue that that's just, that's even more important. And there are other studies that show uh, very good concordance of stress MRI against uh, uh, CATH with FFR. So the MR, so back to the MR informed. So MR informed looked at stable angina, uh, risk factors, uh, excluded P patients with AFib, frequent uh, ectopic beats, uh, very low EF, uh, PCI and bypass. So these are important uh, considerations, and. Um, Patients were randomized to either uh, FFR versus a stress MRI. Uh, FFR was essentially uh, angiography for everyone. Uh, FFR in patients with uh, arteries that are large enough with an intermediate degree of stenosis. If abnormal FFR revascularization was recommended. In terms of uh, the MRI arm, it essentially followed the same uh, parameters that we uh, discussed. So adenosine, uh, stress, rest, using a traditional dose of gadolinium contrast, then delayed enhancement uh, after about 20 minutes. If there is a defect, uh, um, whether it's transmural or uh, subendocardial, uh, to suggest an infarct, then angiography was recommended uh, with a planned revascularization. The composite endpoint was all-cause mortality, um, non-fatal MI and revascularization. And you can see that the rates of revascularization, as you'd expect, were higher with the FFR strategy uh, as compared to the MRI informed strategy. However, this was uh, without any change or added benefit to outcomes. So the survival curves uh, for the primary endpoint were essentially superimposed. And here's how it is uh, in the New England Journal style, uh, where you can see there's literally no difference. So you save on potentially unnecessary revascularizations that are not proven to uh, improve outcomes, and um, you reduce the number of, uh, while maintaining non-inferior, non-inferiority in terms of events. Uh, so let's do another case. So this is a 56-year-old lady with chest pain, and you have stress on top, uh, rest on the bottom, is anyone interested in saying, let's see, uh, Dr. Amr, I see you on Zoom. Are you able to uh, unmute and let us know what you think? Or Dr. Nadim? Or anyone else? We have the audio. Okay. Maybe they're having audio trouble then. Okay, so I'll go through it then. So um, looking at the uh, contrast bolus uh, into the LV and then uh, reaching the myocardium, I don't see any particular perfusion defects. Uh, but like we went through, we're going to look at the LGE imaging. And I'll give you the short answer in the interest of time. There's essentially no uh, LGE. So no LGE and then no... Um, uh, perfusion defects uh, on stress. Uh, 
So uh, this is essentially a normal stress MRI. Uh, the patient still had a cath uh, because of persisting symptoms. This is actually my patient. Um, and had essentially epicardial uh, non-obstructive disease without any uh, critical lesions. So uh, we ended up diagnosing her with uh, coronary macrovascular disease actually on PET imaging. And we'll talk a little bit more about how we can diagnose that on stress MRI. Um, we didn't do the specific sequences and evaluations when it comes to her stress MRI, but uh, this is actually something that's up and coming and really well established in multiple centers. So in terms of assessing coronary flow reserve, one method of doing this by MRI is in a way similar to um, uh, it's, it's by deriving uh, the coronary sinus flow at stress versus rest. And in this study, uh, it was um, shown to be a predictor of major adverse cardiovascular events in patients with either, with e with either known or uh, suspected coronary disease. Um, and we'll talk a little bit more about other quantitative perfusion mapping in terms of diagnosing uh, coronary microvascular disease. This is another case, a six-year-old man with a prior bypass uh, who comes in with chest pain, uh, stress on top, uh, rest on the bottom. And here you see there is a perfusion defect that extends towards, uh, from the subendocardial area epicardially, and it persists for multiple heartbeats. That's also an important uh, parameter to look at. And it fits a coronary territory in the inferior wall and extends into the uh, mid and apical inferior wall as well. Uh, but let's look first at the uh, LGE. Uh, on the LGE, there's a small uh, subendocardial infarct that you can see here, and I wish this would allow me to zoom, but unfortunately it doesn't. Um, so um, similar to the previous case, uh, there's an infarct here with peri-infarct ischemia, and the patient did have actually uh, his bypass to the RCA was occluded, uh, and his native RCA was also uh, totally occluded, and he was treated medically. Uh, let's look at this case. So I'm showing you the Cine imaging here. You see there's severe asymmetrical, um, asymmetric septal hypertrophy. Uh, we don't see any SAM. And here's the stress imaging. And you see there is a perfusion defect predominantly here in the hypertrophy segment, which you can see extends for multiple heartbeats. It doesn't have that classic appearance that we saw on the previous image where it has that sort of wedge shape to it. Here, if, if I could convince you, it has a little bit of a heterogeneous uh, sort of shape to it and it's uh, predominantly in those hypertrophied segments. So what I didn't tell you um, is that this patient is 28. So the likelihood of obstructive coronary disease is very low. And why is it that they have a perfusion defect? Uh, if you look at their LGE, uh, and obviously you know that the patient has, a hyper, has hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, uh, you see that they're scarring in the areas uh, predominantly where the hypertrophy is and also in others. And the patient went on to have coronary, um, anatomic coronary imaging and didn't really have any uh, atherosclerotic disease or stenosis or bridge or anything. So. Um, the conclusion from this case is that patients with hypertrophic cardiomyopathy can have uh, perfusion defects on imaging, particularly in the hypertrophy segments. These have prognostic values anecdotally and from some research findings. There's um, data to show that these perfusion defects can predict the occurrence of or the progression of uh, myocardial scarring in the areas with defects, and they have uh, an association with reduced exercise capacity and uh, it's something that's still pr predominantly in the research realm, uh, but these are things to watch out for uh, in cases like this. This is another kind of similar scenario. So uh, a 74-year-old man with uh, congestive heart failure, dyspnea, um, LVH on echo, and he has this defect on stress on top uh, versus rest here. And notice he has a defect essentially in the entirety uh, of the circumference of the LV is predominantly subendocardial. Uh, it extends for multiple heartbeats, so we don't think it's artifact. You don't see it on rest. And the key thing here is that he doesn't, uh, 
uh, it doesn't fit any coronary territory um, unless you could argue that it's left main. But like we said, you have to take into account all of the findings of all of the imaging. Uh, so here on his LGE, he actually had amyloid and um, he had a cath that didn't show any obstructive disease. So not only in hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, but also other cardiomyopathies, you could potentially have um, findings that may be, associated, may be related to microvascular disease or um, um, intramural disease that is not explained by epicardial disease. Um, here's another case. So since we went through the HCM cases, uh, another case of asymmetric septal hypertrophy, SAM, uh, LVOT obstruction, and he had a stress. So this is all stress uh, going from the base to the apex. And notice he has a perfusion defect here that extends down into the mid-segment, extends down here also, and extends all the way here into the apex. Uh, let's see, is there anyone who has any mics that are functional? And s Amr? Nadim? No, I still no. Um, so, do you call this a perfusion abnormality related to ACM or is this coronary disease? Some of these cases can be tough, you know, one could argue that there's no significant perfusion abnormality in the, um, in the septum where, where it's actually most hypertrophied. Uh, this does fit a coronary territory that's like an LAD diagonal type of uh, pattern. So not all of the cases are, you know, black and white when it comes to this. And um, again, you know, you're going to get a lot more bang for your buck when you use your LGE imaging to help you. So on LGE, this patient actually has an infarct here inferiorly. Uh, there's a small area of scarring here uh, in that same area where you're actually seeing the perfusion defect. And it's, it's tricky. I think it's reasonable to say that this is potentially an infarct as well, particularly because the patient already has established coronary disease based on us seeing his, uh, uh, his LGE imaging. So his cath was recommended and he actually did have a disease in the diagonal um, right here. And he ended up uh, with a myectomy and a lima to the LAD. So uh, latest developments uh, with the time that I have, uh, quantitative perfusion mapping, as I was uh, alluding to, uh, now is a little bit more, um, um, let's say, uh, user-friendly. It doesn't require a lot of post-processing and an advanced, um, uh, uh, whether it's tracing or processing of images. Uh, there's now sequences that are uh, fairly well established in terms of diagnostic and prognostic data. And let me tell you where a potential benefit may be. This is a paper that came out recently that looked at perfusion mapping in patients with multivessel disease, um, similar to the case that I showed you earlier. Um, it actually showed that in terms of visual assessment versus perfusion, quantitative perfusion assessment, there isn't really a big difference when it comes to single vessel disease. But where the potential benefit can happen is patients with two vessel or three vessel disease where perfusion, uh, quantitative perfusion imaging actually had a potential advantage over, over just visual assessment. And in terms of coronary microvascular disease and differentiating that from multivessel disease and epicardial disease, uh, these quantitative perfusion uh, parameters can actually help you try to um, identify the patient's CFR um, and determine whether it's uh, microvascular disease versus obstructive disease. And you have to integrate essentially same as we've been doing, the LGE findings, uh, the visual perfusion defect, uh, the CINE imaging, as well as uh, now the quantitative perfusion defect. Okay, I think this may be the last case. So a 66-year-old man, uh, prior bypass, uh, now has angina. Uh, CINE images show thinning and a wall motion abnormality here and in the inferior wall suggestive of an infarct. Uh, here's the stress. You see a perfusion defect in the same area in the RCA territory. Um, 
now we can't tell if it's uh, just the infarct or um, if this is you know additional ischemia beyond just the infarct we have to look at the LGE and notice here also there's a perfusion defect in the anterior wall that extends here in the mid segments down here and here and all the way to the apex on his LGE uh, there is an infarct here in the inferior wall like we suspected and on his cath um, he actually had um, severe left main slash proximal LED disease uh, which was treated with BCI. He does have a lima but his lima was actually connected to this to his CERC um, and his RCA was occluded uh, with a patent graft. Okay so in conclusion uh, stress MRI is powerful uh, for uh, a comprehensive, non-invasive uh, ischemic evaluation while maintaining a detailed assessment when needed. Um, you can do a 20-minute scan and assess the uh, ischemia and scar, uh, or if the patient has multiple things going on, uh, then you have to, uh, then you can go to 40 minutes and still answer a lot of questions without having the patient to go through multiple uh, lines of testing. Uh, the new 2021 uh, chest pain guidelines now recommend CMR. Um, with a strong class of recommendation and equivalent really to most other functional modalities in most scenarios. In certain scenarios, it's actually preferred also, uh, potentially coronary microvascular disease, uh, an MI without obstructive disease, and um, stress MRI can be performed efficiently, but also importantly is more cost effective uh, than uh, many other non-invasive strategies uh, while maintaining non-inferiority in terms of events uh, compared to an FFR guided strategy. Uh, quantitative perfusion MRI has great potential, uh, particularly in patients with multivessel disease, microvascular disease, and now it's um, you know commercially available and uh, easily do easily doable. Okay, so any breakthroughs around the corner? I think uh, the hottest thing right now is the quantitative perfusion, and. Um, there are still other uh, major advantages that are happening. Uh, for example, 3D LGE assessment, um, trying to obtain multiple, uh, a wider coverage. You know, some of the criticism to MRI is um, that you're only getting three slices of the LV rather than the entirety of the LV. But in reality, I would say, you know, the way coronary disease behaves, usually having those three slices will give you more than what you need uh, to assess epicardial disease. Uh, any questions from here? Or anything else? Okay, well, it looks like we're all done. Uh, thank you all for attending, and we'll see you all next week.